Thank you everybody for coming to the talk on a, on a summer Wednesday. I'm sure people are busy with other things. Um, the title of the talk today is Are They Then Future? I am Professor Carmen Alvaro Carreini. My pronouns are he, hers, or they, them. I myself identify as non binary trans. I am a associate professor of anthropology at the College of Lovely Cross. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, feel free to uh, ask me questions during the talk or after the talk, but you can also email me questions at ajaring at holycross.edu. So what do I mean by our day and future? Um, I'm kind of fascinated by how quickly non-binary identities are becoming prevalent in the United States, particularly among Gen Z. So according to the 2021 Gallup poll, we found that 26% of LGBTQ youth identify as non-binary, um, and another 20% of LGBTQ youth are questioning their gender identity, right? Like that's a huge percentage of queer and trans youth thinking about gender as something beyond simply masculine or feminine, right? Um, and so this is very intriguing to me, and it's also, to be honest, something that inspired me. So when my Gen Z students began coming out as non-binary or as trans, it gave me the courage to sort of think, right? It basically gave me the possibility. Is there something beyond the masculine or the feminine men and women, right? Are, are there more things beyond those two categories for gender? And even though I had taken courses of gender theory, queer theory for since graduate school, it was, this is a new thing that goes even beyond what has been theorized until now about gender. Uh, so why is it happening? Why are non-binary people existing, sort of uh, insisting that you use different pronouns for them, different names for them, right? If you listen to right wing media accounts of white trans and non-binary people uh, are on the rise, they say it's because radical ideology supposedly are being taught in schools, or they claim that there's a social contagion that puts pressure on youth to identify as trans and non-binary, right? The problem with this argument is that it basically assumes that transness is dangerous and unnatural, right? They want to stop any kind of a lot of legislation being passed in states like Florida are literally trying to legislate in a way transness, right? Telling people you can't talk about it, it doesn't exist, students aren't allowed to identify as that, right? Um, really course and then out of coming out, uh, even to the friends. Um, transness is a is according to most uh, scholars of gender, a human natural way to experience gender. Um, and the argument, the right argument is that the gender identities are not socially taught and transmitted as well. So one of the things that trans people point out is our society is set up with the gender binary incredibly rigid and only can only identify as a man or as a woman. That is not the case across all cultures of the world. Our culture is very binary. Uh, and that's socially taught, right? We teach our children, we teach our kids that that's the only way we can be. And in fact, trans people have to go against the grain, non binary people have to go against the grain to insist no, it exists beyond the binary or I want to transition to another gender that it wasn't assigned to her, right? But it's still very difficult to be trans or binary in the United States. Uh, the trans scholar to the term makes a powerful analogy between transness and left-handedness, right? So we used to stigmatize the handedness and we forced kids who were left-handed to use their right hands to write, to play. It was demonized. Like being left-handed was demonized as a horrible thing that was that should be basically eliminated from society. And this meant that very, very few people were allowed to be left-handed or identified as left-handed in the early 1900s. And then you see this interesting spike once the stigma was finally gone, once sort of doctors came around to saying, actually, there's nothing wrong with being left-handed. It's literally a natural variation in humans. Some humans are said to happen to be left-handed. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the percentage of that has began to rise kind of drastically and then stabilize. So now we know that among men it's about around 14%, or among women it's around 10% of the population is left-handed, and now it's now stable. And we realize this is kind of the natural percentage of people in the United States that are left-handed. Um, so the, what Julia Serrano opposes is that uh, as trans and American identities are uh, finally allowed to exist, people have it's gone from a very, very tiny percentage of just rebels who were like, I'm trans despite all the obstacles, as it's becoming more accepted there is a rough, sharp rise, not because there's social contagion, but because simply people are allowed to be who they are naturally, 
and therefore their society increases according to their society sort of perceives that it's an increase, but it doesn't mean that it was always it wasn't always there, it's just like left-handed people were always there, right? They just weren't allowed to exist and to practice their left-handedness, they're really taught to use the right hand instead. Uh, one way to think about sex nowadays is that sex is not dimorphic, it's not simply men or women, as you see on the graph at the top, right here. Let me see. Uh, yes, I can't show you, but the graph at the top shows this idea that simply there's men and there's women and there's nothing in between, right? That's the idea that it's dimorphic, right? There's only two categories that you can fit in. Uh, but even sex, which is a biological expression of physical attributes associated with male or female chromosomes, hormones, and genitals, right? So sex is already complicated because it has three, at least three different things that make part of it, chromosome forming genitals, right? Um, and they don't always agree with each other, right? And there are people who are XXY, there are a lot of people that can end up to make complicating this, this thing. So now Dr. Anton Sterling's work demonstrated that there's a significant number of people that are intersex. That uh, we used to use the term uh, hermaphroditic for them, but sort of it's because um, they no longer like that term. It just is more accurate and it's less uh, stigmatizing. And so there's a, a significant intersex population. Uh, it seems it's around 2% of the population that is between male, exists between the male and the female biologically, like sexually. And the sex is by model and not by morphic, right? There are strong. Right, for a number of people that are simply male or female, but there are a small percentage of people that are in between. And gender is even more of a fun. There's more people who seem to exist between women and men, right? Other genders exist. So, Kay Hildreth, another um, uh, trans activist, has this kind of um, bimodal graph to sort of explain how this is. So gender is a sort of cultural expression of both masculinity and femininity, right? So when kids are born, we assign them particular according to their genitals, not only their chromosomes or their other aspects of their, of their sex, but simply their genitals, because that's what we can see visibly. We say this is a, a boy or a girl, and we attribute masculinity or femininity to those people, right? Without them, without letting these sort of uh, very young people determine for themselves what gender they are, right? It's supposed to be the gender that is visibly assigned on them. Um, but non binary, gender queer, gender fluid, a gender identity, all these new identities that are coming up show that gender is bimodal and that there are plenty of people who exist somewhere in the middle between the masculine and the feminine. They flow between them, perhaps, or are more gender fluid, or they don't identify with the gender at all. People who are agender say, like, gender is just not something meaningful. To me. And I got imposed this kind of gender when I was young, but a gender, I just don't want to express my gender and they try to. Something for gender expression tends to be a bit more black, right? Uh, binary trans people, people who transition from one gender identity to the other, right? Trans men and trans women are, of course, also breaking down this paradigm by moving from one category to the other, demonstrating that that's possible, right? That was sort of the first step of this gender revolution that we're living in. Um, and so just to give you an example from my own life, right, uh, I came out as queer when I was in my early 20s, and I thought that was sort of it for me in some sense of coming out, and it took me another 20 years to come out as non-binary trans, and I realized I had this feminine aspect to me that I was denying myself, right? I just get a lot of joy out of wearing skirts, out of wearing nail polish, uh, out of wearing my hair long, things that are kind of taboo. For someone assigned male at birth to do. Um, and it was very liberating and very joyful, right? So, like, trans joy is this thing that people feel, right? Or gender euphoria is something that people use. People feel when they finally embrace that aspect of themselves that they've been denying themselves because I was always told since I was very, very young that I should not be a feminine boy, right? So, now that I've embraced that I am feminine, uh, and I mixed the fact non binary, right? I between male and female, it's been a kind of a very joyful experience. But of course, given the constraints of the fact that we live in a society that is still very transphobic, right? Massachusetts is a better place for me to live, but it'd be much harder for me to work there in places like that in South Florida right now. Um, Scholarly definitions of gender are useful here, right? So Judith Butler, a famous author um, um, and the author of a book called Gender Trouble, she's also, uh, they are also published a book called Gender. 
See, uh, they argue that gender is a performance that is socially learned in childhood, right? So again, you get imputed masculine or feminine for your girl, and, and everybody can just do this is what it means to be a boy or a girl. Over time, it's, it acquires the uh, illusion that it's completely natural, right? Like, oh, this person just does what they are, they're a man, like, there's no question about it. But in fact, right, uh, Butler, it is a performance that you have to every day consciously reaffirm, right? Putting on certain clothes, right? Behaving, your body language, everything has to say, this is I'm a man or I am a woman, right? And so people are constantly reaffirming their gender in different ways. Um, and everybody does this aspect of affirming their gender in different ways, you know, whether they're cisgender or transgender. But because something that is kind of illusory in some kind of ways, repeated through social repetition, it can be regarded, it can be reoriented into new directions, right? If you feel like, oh, I, I just don't, this gender that I've been assigned is not something that's making me happy, right? It's not something that's fulfilling. Uh, the philosopher Asta has the insight that gender is converted to people by others in what she calls a game of gender, right? It's kind of a game that has winners and losers, right? In the sense that some people are very good at performing masculinity or performing femininity, and society really rewards them for that. And they punish people who go outside of the gender they were assigned at birth uh, and make them pay the price for it, right? So, Part of what I've seen is that non-binary people, trans people, are trying to rewrite the rules of this game of gender altogether and say, no, there is a space for the in between, there is a space to go and transition to other genders, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? We are allowed to exist in those spaces, in new spaces. When you look at gender non-conformity around the world, you see that there's vast anthropologists and there's vast anthropological evidence that non-Euro-American societies around the world have provided a space for gender nonconformity, even if it was stigmatized, right? So there's all cultures where there was some stigma to be gender nonconforming, but there's still had a category for it, a name. It was allowed to exist, and people had a space in society for it. And other cultures didn't stigmatize it as much, but actually kind of celebrated it, right? So among Native American communities, they have different names for it. Uh, today, people or Native American use the sort of more umbrella term to spirit for all Native American groups, but for every culture treated it in a different kind of way. And it allowed, again, people to be um, feminine men or masculine women and sort of have the roles of the gender that they were not assigned at birth, but a different kind of gender. They were allowed to transition at least through gender roles and clothing. In Thailand, you have Katoi, right? People who were assigned male at birth, but sort of transition into womanhood. And tomboys, right? People assigned female birth, then transitioned into more masculine identities. And in Thailand, it, those identities can be um, quite seen as quite positive, even by family members. Uh, and sort of in Buddhism, it's seen as good karma if you're given the opportunity to be a Katoi or a tomboy. Um, it's sort of, again, a sign of uh, that you have advanced spiritually in a particular kind of way. In India, you have the Hijra, who are stigmatized nowadays. It seems that the colonialism, particular British colonialism, put them in a stigmatized role where they could only be sex workers. But if you go back to very old uh, Hindu texts, you see that Hijras were actually celebrated. For example, the Kama Sutra and other texts celebrate Hijras as uh, sort of very valuable people, right? Uh, in Latin, or over Latin America, you have that I see, a term for people, again, a of birth who are identified as, as feminine in some kind of way. Um, and it's interesting that it's all across very different Latin American countries, and they're incredible activists. And in some more, you have the Papa Bine, uh, which are similar. So these are just a few examples. I could give you many, many more. So this shows that all across human culture and time, People have recognized, oh, these people that are beyond male or female exist, and they should be allowed to exist. So then the question is, right, why is our culture so against it until recently? Like, what did happen? Uh, some people uh, have theorized that the problem was colonialism, right? The strict Euro American gender binary as we know it seems to stem from colonialism because colonialism required very strict gender roles. And very cisgender normative, normative roles in order to exist, right? 
uh, in the sense that when you colonize another country, you wanted gender roles to be very strict to determine who were the men and women in control, right? So for example, um, there was a huge stigma for white women who were colonizers in a non-white country to have sex with anybody white or white men. And so to make all those kind of colonial kind of rules work, you need very strict Right. And this is in fact is what happened. Whenever colonizers arrived at a particular place, they eliminated any kind of gender nonconformity. I'm originally from Ecuador, uh, and I learned only a few years back that where I'm from, Spanish colonizers brutally suppressed this identity called the Cariwari or men women, which were non-binary kind of people who lived in temples dedicated to the androgynous creator deity. So the creator deity, the main deity of the Andes, Viracocha, is an androgynous uh, deity that is neither male nor female. So other deities had gender, but this gender, gender, this creator deity did not, the most important creator deity did not. So to be somebody who was uh, androgynous or the gender non-conforming was to be closer to that creator deity. So if you had their space in the religion, that was very important. The Spanish colonizers arrive into the Andes and they get incredibly angry that these sex. And they put them to death, literally. They, they destroy that aspect of Indian culture to that point where it no longer exists. So even local indigenous communities in Ecuador no longer accept sort of Kaduami. Uh, they're more accepting than the average Ecuadorian, but they're this, this aspect of the religion has been lost. And that was very shocking to me as an Ecuadorian because I realized in growing up in a very gender normative society, I realized colonialism would produce this. I could have grown up in a different kind of society where I colonialism. And that was very powerful to my own gender identity, right? So to embrace gender, gender is beyond the binaries, to decolonize the way of thinking, to literally think about gender beyond colonialism since our society is still rooted in these very colonial ideas and ideologies that say that his heteronormativity is superior, LGBT identities are deviant, they're a threat. And it also helps explain why politicians are so upset with gender, right? It's because it comes from these very old norms that were necessary for creating hierarchies in your American society. And that's why people are so beholden into these hierarchies and they don't want them to go away. Another problem was medicine, right? So medicine unfortunately participated in the colonial enterprise, right, in several ways. But one of the things that it did is it labeled both queer and trans identities as pathology, as abnormal behavior, right? So medicine was part of this system saying what's normal and what's abnormal. Uh, it took a very long time for, and nowadays finally, um, the American Psychological Association, the American Medical Association have finally said, right, transness, queerness are not diseases, they're normal human variation, but it took them a long time to get there, right? Most of the 20th century, they were part of the problem rather than the solution. And the trans scholar Sandy Stone says that gender reassignment clinics uh, up to the 1980s actually enforced very gender normative behavior, so they would only allow trans women to transition if they could prove that they were feminine enough, if they knew how to wear makeup and be proper women, wear the right clothing, uh, and even have like, they basically work as finishing schools for women. Um, so even, even on trans people who wanted to transition, we imposed very rigid uh, gender norms. The gender reassignment clinics uh, imposed very rigid gender norms on trans people. Um, nowadays, that's finally breaking down as doctors are letting patients sort of just live their gender in different ways because everybody's there. So, in order to understand American non binary folks, I have been trying to ethnographic interviews with non binary folks since 2021 to better understand what we have in common. Uh, and even based on 40 interviews with so many small sample, what stands out to me is how diverse the community is. There is no, every in, in, in the American mm -hmm. interview had a slightly different experience. That the next one. Like, there is no, no one way of being a binary, I think it's very helpful. Mm -hmm. And the communities, they are accepting of that papers. Uh, about half of my interviews express the gender dysphoria and seeking out gender from care, right? So the hormone surgeries, for example, top surgery was particularly common among a lot of my interviewees. But about the other half were content with simply expressing their gender through clothes, makeup, and through names and pronouns. 
I'm in that category. I don't plan to make a big transition, but it doesn't mean that my identity is invalid as well, right? Again, most of the gender non-conforming cultures around the world accept that people before a medical decision was even available, right? People didn't need to medically take hormones to prove that they were fat. If that's more like that's a more modern thing to be done. And I'm glad that those hormones and gender affirming care is available. They can be life saving. All people that can approach it tells them that they can be able to harm. They can feel firm through medical transitioning, but not all trans and binary people have to transition, and that's important to keep in mind. Um, and of course, right, the, the politicians that argue that this is somehow right uh, mutilating children are very misinformed because, in fact, med most medical transitions happen in adults. The most thing that people do with underage kids normally is giving them puberty blockers, so they have some more time to decide until at least they're 16 to figure out where the gender is at, but nobody's mutilating children, right? The colleague of underage kids is very common, right? It's gender affirming surgery is very common to use. Um, I like this uh, cool uh, graph that I found in uh, the Proud Trust, right, that talks about about gender being like planets, right? Is there a planet girl, right, that doesn't only hold for people assigned female birth, but, but trans women, a planet boy, right? And, and the idea that it's an entire planet and that there's a, a lot of different ways of being a boy or girl, a man or a woman, but it's something that everybody should be aware of as we fight the more toxic, toxic forms of masculinity or femininity in our culture and allow people to be more healthy, allow men, for example, to express emotion. Uh, and allow women to not have to wear to be value centered by their beauty, right? Um, and of course, perhaps there is an environment planet. Perhaps there is a different gender location where you can be different, right? Where you are borrowing aspects of both or neither, and right? you're sort of experimenting with different ways of being a person, right? Um, what, what's common among non binary interviewees? That uh, interviews that I had made is was that there was a lot of difficulty in getting people to respect their gender identity, right? For some, they suffer rejection from their family. For others, they suffer problems in their workplace. I was surprised about how many people um, had either given up their job opportunities or lost their opportunities because they were trans and binary. Uh, a lot of people suffer discrimination in their schools or from their doctors who are misinformed and sort of don't give them access to hormones or surgery or anything very difficult. Um, and yeah, so lost job opportunities and job advancement was very common, unfortunately. And many non binary folks reported feeling imposter syndrome, right? Questioning whether they were non binary or trans enough. Um, but a lot of them said online communities of other people like me, right? Because a lot of people go through this in a very lonely kind of manner. So the internet has provided a space where you can at least find people who have similar experiences to you and say, oh, I'm, I'm valid because somebody has a slightly similar experience to me in a different state and different city, right? So if you're not in a very big urban area, it can be very difficult to find other trans and non-binary people to have community with. So this way, the internet has become super important uh, for people to figure out who they are, right? And I, I used, I, I was for a Facebook group on the minor folks that really helped me for that to figure out who I was, even though they don't. Um, another question that people ask is, are non-binary people trans? Of the 40 non-binary people I interviewed, 39 also identified as trans. Based on, based on the uh, basic idea that if you're not cisgender, right, if you're not the same gender you are assigned at birth, then you fall under the trans umbrella. The trans umbrella is a very wide umbrella that includes all sorts of different identities and then binary kids within the umbrella, right? Um, I think we should avoid policing the boundaries between trans and non-binary identities because non-binary is such a broad category that it will help expand the trans category by showing people that trans is not simply defined by gender dysphoria or the medical transition, right? It's simply you don't identify with the gender. There's something about the gender standard birth that is not making you happy, so you're going to experiment with gender in any kind of way, right? Um, I think we need to be pathologized all trans identities, and we have to give people the autonomy to decide whether they require gender affirming care rather than having doctors or in Florida, in Florida politicians deciding for them, right? Uh, people should have the autonomy to decide 
what do I want to do with my gender, right? So I really want to experience my gender from now on. But we're not quite there yet. Um, Argentina, Brazil, as I was saying, like I so saw my other aspect, I do a lot of research in Brazil um, because I'm, I'm fascinated with their trans activists and they're really ahead of their time. So to give you two quick examples, Argentina has a gender identity law that is one of the most progressive gender um, laws on gender in the world because it helps people completely bypass medical approval. A doctor doesn't have to say you are indeed trans for you to seek gender friendly care through the public health service. So they have a universal health system, they don't, so they're already ahead of that in that way. Um, but you can also get new documents. You don't need to get surgery to get new documents. You can simply go to, a, a, let's say, a place where you get your driver's license and say, this is my new name, I mean, new gender identity. And they just have to put it on. Like they have to accept people's autonomy to decide the gender, which is amazing, and the name, okay? um, And Brazil elected two travesties. One of is this non-binary trans feminine identity that's very common in Brazil. People saying male at birth and are now more uh, identified with female names and pronouns. Um, and two travesty women to, uh, who are elected to their national congress. Like our national congress, right, the US Congress has never had trans people in it. Brazil has already has two. Even under very difficult circumstances, because we had a very right wing president until recently that was very openly transphobic. And in those circumstances, the two trans women won national office. So they're doing really well. It shows the strength of the actor. Uh, and they do amazing things. I can talk more about it if you want. But um, I just wanted to give a quick example of how other countries are handling this uh, and sort of how they're further ahead uh, compared to the United States. And normally we think the United States is very far ahead in terms of human rights, but that's not always the case. A lot of the non-binary people I talked to simply had this message that I'm not broken, what's broken is binary, and the gender binary is the problem. We need to eliminate the perception that somehow trans people and many people are broken. What is broken is a gender binary that was socially constructed to violently right, uh, ostracize anyone outside the binary. As people come out at a younger age, we need to protect them. We need to protect trans kids from all these political attempts to delegitimize them, curtail their identities, not allow them to transition in any kind of way, even at school. Um, and we can't forget that trans and minor people of color suffer the worst trends of the violence, right? We, because of intersecting or interlocking oppressions that make them more vulnerable, right? So, for example, in the United States, there's uh, we have very high rates of murders against trans people most of those murders are against black trans women because black trans women being black being women and being trans have these three interlocking oppressions that make them super vulnerable to violence in the streets violence from their families violence from the police violence from all these different systems um and therefore they're they're victims of violence frequently and I think that's important to know to notice because sometimes when we do things like Transgender Day of Remembrance and we, we don't talk about race enough, we just say, oh, it's, it's horrible, race people are victims of violence, but we don't say who is the victim of violence. Um, and there's a, an author I'd like who argues that we, we focus, we, we focus much on the negative in US trans activism, that it ends up scaring people from coming out because they're like, oh, there's so much violence against trans people, they can't come out. Um, and we need to focus more on the joy coming out, know, right? Of the fact that I was happily surprised when I came out at a Catholic college that all of my colleagues immediately switched pronouns, switched names without any problem, right? I think I'm very privileged, but it's surprising that we, that a Catholic college would get this. So sometimes things are better than you expect, and we didn't talk about it, right? So I think it's important to talk about that. Um, just to wrap up, right, what I found that said about non binary identities, expressions, pronouns, is that we're forcing the cisgender majority to confront identities that exist beyond the binary, right? So every time you as an individual, right, push people to use statement pronouns or use a different kind of pronoun, you're pushing society forward by telling them, look, there, there is something beyond male and female, and you have to respect me for who I am, right? So every every transfer from every non-binary person is an activist simply by the act of existing and demanding to be treated with respect and by control. Uh, we are moving away from the language of being born in the wrong body, which is very much the idea that 
uh, again, there's only two genders. And so we need to encourage the language of accepting all bodies in their wonderful diversity and giving people a time. Uh, I think we need to dismantle how gendered our world is in general, right? So we think of bathrooms, right? For me, it was very important that my college also began instituting uh, gender neutral bathrooms. Not everywhere, but uh, there's at least one gender neutral bathroom per building where I'm comfortable entering because as someone who is in binary, if I enter the man's bathroom, I'm going to get very weird looks because I don't look completely masculine. If I enter a women's bathroom, same thing. So having a safe space for me where I can just go pee without a problem is very important. But around the world, around right, the gas station, or at all, usually there's only male and female bathrooms, and therefore those are not safe spaces for trans people and the binary. Uh, clothing stores, right, where clothing, clothing, fashion world can be quite binary and have you know, male clothing, female clothing. Um, and now that I shop at women's clothing, right, it's sort of uncomfortable sometimes, so I shop a lot of mine. Um, but what would it mean for clothing stores to accept that there are no binary folks and maybe either gender neutral clothing or, or, or clothing that mixes aspect of both genders, right? Like that would be interesting, I think, for the fashion world to think about those possibilities. But we also have to think about athletic competitions. There, there's people, uh, non binary actors have been pushing. And non binary actors have been pushing to say, like, well, I can fit in those categories. Can we have a non binary category for runners? Can we have a non binary category for actors? What would that mean, right? And so, yes, having non binary people exist and be respected would mean restructuring society as we know it. But I think we can do it. I think it's possible and necessary to include people who are different. But of course, the background is there and very good. Um, and ideally, we wouldn't have labels. I think labels are are, are very useful in so far as they let people uh, celebrate who they are. But ideally, we would live in a future where we wouldn't need labels, right? So I have, I'm friends with a couple, for example, whose their daughter didn't have to come out to them as lesbian because it was very clear from the start that in their family, being LGBT wasn't a big deal. So she just said, oh, this is my girlfriend. But she had, didn't have to come out as a lesbian, if that makes sense, right? So what would it mean to create a future where gender is not a source of oppression, but a form of play, something to just enjoy, where people would be allowed to wear dresses one day and a suit the next day and it wouldn't be a big deal, I think would be a wonderful future to live in, right? Uh, a trans feminist future would also hopefully provide equal opportunities to any gender, right? The, even all, with all the feminist advances we've had in society, um there's still pervasive gender inequalities right women still make 80 cents to the dollar women still are denied job opportunities and, and, and advancement to the gender so i think the only way to get around that is we actually start dismantling gender as a system and make it much more flexible right where gender becomes less important to people than to people's identities in general might be the only way to produce a more equal society where gender isn't so, gender discrimination isn't so prevalent. One of my favorite non binary people in the world is Alok, uh, who you say the pronouns. Uh, Alok says that the gender non conforming person I am only allowed to exist in the past or in the future. People tell me that I am the future of gender or that I am some relic that existed prior to colonization, but I'm like, girl, I am here right now. So part of what I worried about this talk is I might be doing exactly this, right? So be like, oh, we said before colonialism or the future is is our day in the future, right? Um, but in fact, we exist today, right, in the present, right? So I think this is a very good reminder that we need to think of talk about the present, not simply the future or the past, right? Our utopia starts now in these spaces where we validate people's existence, right? Um, and yeah, I will open. I will end there with the look. It was amazing, and open up the questions. I did have a, a question. I'm looking back on one of the slides here when you were talking about. Um, athletics, and I'm 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 kind of curious about that because uh, certainly as uh, and I do identify as female bi binary, so seventy years old, and I can think about all of the athletic events that I've participated in in my life, and 
and to have competitions that dismantle that the the it's male and or it's female athletics. Um, and quite frankly, I find blurring that would be really challenging because just genetically the uh the, the hormonal uh, differences that exist within our bodies make it almost impossible to, well, you can compete, but if you have an interest in winning um, in, in certainly many kinds of competition, that would be impossible um, uh, to, to um, well, not necessarily impossible, but highly unlikely. And obviously I'm generalizing, but that's, I, I don't know. Do you have any other thoughts about that? I see you've put up a slide, so maybe you've got something to say that might help me with that. Yeah, so right here in Massachusetts, there's a runner called Cal Calamia who insisted to the Boston Marathon, we need an environment. So Cal Calamia was assigned female at birth, started transitioning, is now an non-binary, right? It would be unfair for Cal to compete with uh, with women because he's on testosterone. It would be unfair for him to compete with men because he doesn't have the quite the same right athletic level, right? So Kalkalanian argued we need our own category. So Kalkalanian has argued we should completely do away with categories because yes, men have a slight advantage when it comes to running with women. So if we just had one category, it would only be men winning. But Kalpani has said we need a uh, women's category, a men's category, and we need a third non-binary category for people who are okay. in two. And, and in fact, got the Boston Marathon to say yes, and now there's a third category in the Boston Marathon, which I thought was wonderful uh, through his activism, right? Um, so it's not about undoing completely, right, sort of categories okay. of gender. Athletics, but just creating perhaps a third category for people who are, especially because there's so much controversy about trans athletes and where they fit. So giving them a space to exist might be one way around that. These points, right? Um, um, yeah, it's kind of an interesting idea. Okay, I get that, and that, yeah, I get that. That makes that fits, if you will. Thank you. No problem. Hi, it's Nicole. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Um, I really appreciate it. I feel like um, it, it's been something that I know a bit about, but it's really nice to um, hear from someone, you know, who's willing to put the information out there. There's been a lot of talk about, you know, not shifting the weight or load of explaining, um, you know, different identities and different burdens that people have. Um you know, to, to other, to, to people who don't want it. So it's really great to have you as a resource to explain things, um, especially understanding like terminology that should no longer be used because people would prefer not to and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate it. And I just wanted to say thank you for taking this time to do this. Yeah. I also wanted to, to maybe just quickly, um, not to like, get too, <laughs> too much into it but I think Arlene's point about sports was interesting I feel like there's a lot of debate about that and I wonder if you're willing to share like your personal opinion do you think that having sort of a third non-binary category would be something that you personally agree with or do, do you think that there's there's other better options um, yeah I think that that's in some one way to move forward right to sort of include just trans people and better people exist and so that this might be a way around it. Cause it's tricky, right? Sort of where do people come to so that it's quote unquote fair is a fair question to ask, particularly in sports, right? Um, there is evidence that if trans women are on um, sort of hormone replacement therapy for several years, their bodies literally don't and don't have the advantages anymore that they would have when they before they transitioned as men. So I think that we should at least consider that trans women should be allowed to consider in women's sports. But it's interesting because a lot of it is not about what's happening in the Olympics or in the Boston Marathon. A lot of the, the backlash is against kids who literally just want to enjoy playing a sport and not allowed, right? So I think a lot of the backlash is not even about fairness, really. 
um, at the Olympic level or at professional levels it's about kids who are just competing with one another and we're not allowing them to participate in sports because they're fans. They're not allowed to do any sports basically because they're fans. And I think that's unfair because sports is such a great place to find community, find inclusion. So we just need to figure out how to include kids or trans in sports instead of banning that. Um, so yeah, that's sort of my thought on, on the controversy. Yeah. And then I actually just have a quick question. I know in like when I took psychology back in like high school and college, they said that there's like a Kinsey scale for like sexuality. Um, is there anything like that for gender where it's kind of, you know, on a scale of like male to female, you can fall anywhere in between or are they? Yeah, yeah, people are, there's no name for it, but people are basically proposing that it's very similar. Okay. Like it's yeah. sexuality, right? Sort of the pulse of being 100% straight mm -hmm. and like, or 100% gay are actually not that accurate. And yeah. A lot of people are in between there, like mm -hmm. slightly attracted to one gender and more to the other, right? Um, gender might be similar in the sense that people that are like, I'm 100% only men. Or only, mm -hmm. like, actually, a lot of us have gender duality in us. We we don't allow ourselves to express it. So it would be interesting to I live in a world where that would be possible. We have one more question, uh, just because I've not heard the term before. And... Uh, and so if you could help me understand, you used uh, the term bimodal and dimorphic. And I do not know those words. And even at looking at the slide, can you help me get a better understanding of exactly um, what the two terms mean? So dimorphic just means that there's only two of something, right? So to say that sex is dimorphic is to say there's only men or women, and that's it. There's nothing that okay. exists in between, which we know is not true because intersex people exist, right? Two percent of the population is XXY or different forms of intersex. Um, bimodal is when something has strong elements of two, right? So there's a, a lot of people who are either male or female, but my bimodal allows, it's a kind of distribution, a graph distribution that allows for uh, a mix between male and male or female or masculine and feminine, right? Um, it says, yes, most people, of course, most people strongly identify as men or as women, but that doesn't mean that there's something in between. So bimodal is a more accurate description of how gender and sex work. Great. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Thanks for coming, you guys. Thanks for having me. <laughs>